Before I um, introduce uh, John Borgonovo from, from UCC, I just a few housekeeping matters. We're, we're asked to keep our masks on during the day and during the presentations. There will be lunch, you'll be glad to hear, at around one o'clock and um, we'll be able to open doors and windows and people can circulate and so on. So a cup of tea and, and a sandwich at that stage. The, the rough schedule, um, depending on how many rows and extended uh, conversations we have um, is to start now obviously with, with, with the, this morning session to finish around 1 then to resume around 2.15 um, Gabriel will be with us at 2.15 and we'll close at around 4 um, in each case each session I'm hoping that we can have questions at the end of both papers rather than at the end of each paper so that will give hopefully each speaker um, due um, time uh, an equal time to, to explore the issues um, that they want to explore. Um, before introducing John, I just want to say um, what a credit it is to the association um, for us to be in this building, for them to have built this building, um, and not just for the, uh, the, the beauty and the functionality um, of the structure itself, which is an extraordinary achievement by any community standards, but because of what enables it enables events like this um, it's a community initiative, it's all about locality, um, and the association is really all about local history, but local history is what makes national and international history, and this day is testament of that, um, the fact that we've got experts coming to talk to us of international repute, um, who will bring the local dimension into a broader and a wider focus, and that's the function, one of the functions of this building, this association. Uh, and uh, indeed, it's, it, 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 I'm very proud as a Kilmurray person uh, to be associated uh, with all of this achievement. And, and there's huge, huge regard to you and credit to you. John Borgonovo. He wasn't born in Kilmurray, as his name might uh, suggest. <laughs> John Borgonovo was born in San Francisco. And he earned his BA in the University of Oregon, where he became fascinated by Irish history and quickly realised that the best place in the world to come and study Irish history is University College of Cork. <laughs> so he decamped to Cork, um, where he did an MA in 1997. Um, John has written a number of books at various times in his career, converting his master's and his PhD, indeed, into uh, extremely uh, important uh, monographs. His first book was on Flor Florence and Josephine O'Donoghue's War of Independence, uh, compiled from a set of memoirs and, and correspondence and bibliographic material. Uh, and and, and uh, his, his next monograph was called Spies, Informers and the anti Sinn Féin Society, which was an updated version of that thesis. He went on in UCC, funded by the UCC President's Scholarship, to do a distinguished dissertation, which, as we all know, um, was, pres was, was published in book form as The Dynamics of War, Cork City, 1916 to 1918, published by... Cork University Press. Um, John is a lecturer in UCC, in the School of History, and he also teaches numerous courses in international history, both at undergraduate and, and, and postgraduate uh, level. So he's best known for his work really on the Irish Revolutionary Period, and, 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 and a lot of his work engages in some of the very heavily contested debates of that period. So he's not afraid to engage in post skirmish skirmishes around <laughs> Bill Michael, around um, the the, the uh, Bandon Valley massacre, for instance, um, and, and other you know really emotive and, and important events from a, a local perspective, which he has analysed uh, with great skill from uh, from a macro perspective. John is also one of the editors of the groundbreaking Atlas of the Irish Revolution, a great tome that many of us used to keep doors open and laptops. Um, up off the table, um, and he's also very well known, as we know, um, commentator on radio and television um, on things historical. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome him as a colleague and as our guest here today. John is going to talk about the context and implications of the 1920 hunger strike. So I'd like you to give a warm Kilmurray welcome to John Bogan. <laughs> John, as you probably know, uh, is, was a key figure in support in the kind of conceptualization of the Atlas of the Irish Revolution. 
uh, and uh, the subsequent, a lot of the subsequent projects. Mm -hmm. So he's a great leader and a big proponent of history at UCC, um, and he's an important figure uh, that you guys have in your back pocket here in Kilmurray, so <laughs> it's great. Uh, I'm gonna sit down and stand up uh, so I can work a little bit of my PowerPoint magic. Um, and it's great to be back here. Uh, I was at the front door and I realized I know about half the people by name, so maybe I've been here a little too much. And as John says, it's also fantastic to see the efforts that have been going on here for the last number of years and have culminated in such a fantastic and important center, museum. And it's really a testament to all you folks who are involved, uh, who've done a remarkable achievement. And as also pulling this together, um, everybody who, Dee and everybody who, who kind of put this weekend together uh, amidst trying circumstances. So uh, it's great to be here. So with that note, um, I'm going to try to talk about a few different elements of the McSweeney and kind of the cork hunger strike. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the cork end of the strike, which is often kind of neglected a fair bit. Um, and I'll try to provide a little bit of context for some of the, some of the um, events and kind of episodes. So um, as you might know, or you might not know, hunger striking, let's see if that works out. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, hunger striking was a tactic of passive resistance that had really been popularized by the suffragettes. Uh, and the suffragists had done so as they escalated their campaign and really went into a, a kind of a militant effort to secure suffrage for women voters. Uh, and the use of the hunger strike was really popularized in England, but also was undertaken in Ireland uh, and the United States. But the use of hunger strikes basically ran into a wall with the prison authorities who used force feeding to end hunger strikes. And force feeding is apparently a really horrific experience. Uh, and for the suffragists, they basically saw not just the hunger strike, but the experience of force feeding as something to be that really marked you out, marked you out for a commitment. And they used to give little medals to to their members who had been uh, force fed as kind of a sign of their bravery and their commitment to the cause. Um, and under special legislation, uh, and actually Gabriel Doherty would know the year. I'm trying to think of the year. I think it's about 1913. Uh, there was special legislation brought in to the United Kingdom, which is popularly called the Cat, Cat and Mouse Act. And the Cat and Mouse Act basically allowed that for people who were force fed or people who were on hunger strike, uh, who either could not be force fed or were reacting poorly to being force fed, they could be released from prison and hospitalized. And then when they regained them, their strength, they would be rearrested and taken back to jail. So that was kind of the legislative process that we brought in. But so that just also indicates how widespread hunger striking was at that stage. And there were a couple of hunger strikes around the Dublin lockout by members of the ITGWU. Uh, and the, uh, in Frangoc and the, the Easter Rising prisoners had considered a mass uh, hunger strike at one stage as well. So the tactic was established and it was adapted by the Republicans. Um, the kind of the best known, actually let me take a step, step backwards. Um, so after the Easter Rising and during kind of 1917 and 1918, the number of political prisoners in Ireland went skyrocketed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and a couple thousand were in camps in Wales and England and what have you and after the rising. And you also had similar bouts of mass arrests and incarcerations in 1917 and 1918. And what you see is the development of a, of a Republican prison culture. Really, it kind of starts after 1916, and, but it expands to all the general prisons 
when there, when there gets a critical mass of prisoners in there, you know, 10, 20, 30 people who can organize. And basically, what you see is the creation of military structures of prisoners. So they create their own hierarchies. They try to control interactions between the prison authorities and the prisoners through these self-appointed leaders, these elected leaders who represent the prisoners. And they also try to get the prisoners, uh, the Republicans would try to get their prisoners to, you know, basically adopt military discipline, to follow instructions. They, all, they also do things like they drill, they begin to take classes, uh, they kind of strategize about what they're going to do. Uh, but the big thing is to get people conditioned, get prisoners conditioned to think of themselves as part of a collective and as part of basically an army. Uh, and that this resistance continues in prison, that they're in, even though they're incarcerated, they're not out of the fight, they can still wage a propaganda campaign. They can still try to escape, what have you. But the big thing is to condition themselves to be part of the movement and to resist when deemed advisable. Um, and I'd also say that the movement produces a number, a number of the leaders who we associate with the movement Republican movement, the independence movement, are prison leaders. So Michael Collins makes his reputation in prison after the Easter Rising. Eamon de Valera makes his reputation leading the prisoners in Lincoln Jail after the or Reading Jail after um, after 1916. There's a big prison strike in Belfast, and Austin Stack leads that. And Austin Stack makes his reputation as a prison leader because in prison. There's no hiding your character. <laughs> there's no, uh, there's no uh, like it's, it's hard to fool people. Like if you're naturally charismatic, if you're naturally positive, if you're a good decision maker, you're a good strategist, you're often recognized by your fellow prisoners. Uh, and kind of natural leadership tends to be promoted uh, by people who are suffering kind of this mass incarceration. Um, so, the kind of the main uh, another figure who emerges briefly is Thomas Ashe, uh, and he leads a strike in 1917. And I'm not, I'm not talking about a hunger strike. Well, it is a hunger strike. You get different forms of resistance. You get you might get refusal to work. You might get refusal to uh, uh, to wear clo prison clothing. You might have refusal to obey orders. Sometimes you get things like. Uh, the, the prisoners demand free association and they rip the wall, they rip the doors off the walls, kind of tunnel through and then fight and barricade themselves in prison and prison uh, <coughs> landings and prison uh, uh, wings of the prison. Uh, and there are a number of these. There, there's not just one, there's dozens of them. Uh, kind of big fights and where prison, Republican prisoners are collectively demanding some kind of mitigation of their treatment and they're using different forms of resistance. Um, so in late 19, or in 1917, one of these strikes is led by Thomas Ashe, who's a, you know, survived, a, a prominent Republican. He's also one of the big leaders, uh, the main leaders of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Uh, and he leads prisoners in Mountjoy, and they decide to escalate their resistance and to go on hunger strike. And this is the first kind of use of widespread use of hunger strike uh, among the Irish prisoners. And it's 1917. And Thomas Ashe is force fed. And in the process of being force fed, the, uh, a funnel is kind of shoved down his throat and it nicks his esophagus and he dies, kills him, bleeds out. Uh, and this is a major mobilization point for the independence movement. There are mass demonstrations across the country. And this is at a relatively early stage. This is one of the kind of, just as the independence movement starting to find its ground, starting to take on a, a bit of its, um, uh, really starting to form. It's, it's, I think it's September 1917. So the new Sinn Féin party's just getting together. The Irish volunteers are coming to Mon are starting to rapidly expand, but it's still very early stages. And the Thomas Ashe, the outcry over Thomas Ashe's death is a mobilizing point. It's, it leads to demonstrations, it leads to uh, kind of big, big efforts of kind of uh, public mourning 
There are memorial masses across the country. There are play, you know, things, black flags and black buntings formed. And then on top of that, there's an inquiry into his death. And in, during the inquiry, the prison doctors and the prison authorities are made to testify about this force feeding. And the, those hearings are also front page news for weeks. And they actually implicate the prison doctor who has killed somebody. And the fact that he is poss can possibly be charged with murder sends a shudder throughout the Irish prison service. And for prison authorities who are used to basically having their own, who haven't been subjected to this level of resi organized resistance before, and who have enjoyed kind of political support, all of a sudden they feel quite isolated. And they feel really vulnerable if something goes wrong again. Because what happens if it's a changing government? What happens if, the, if Dublin Castle decides to throw one of these guys under the bus? So there's a great reluctance and really an unwillingness among prison doctors to engage in force feeding going forward. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the context. Um, now, the Republicans pick up on this, and uh, hunger strikes become quite common uh, in different prisons around the country. And what's one of the fascinating things about the hunger strikes, if you look at them nationally, is there's a contagion. If you have a hunger strike in one prison, you all of a sudden the other prisons in Limerick, Sligo, Kilkenny, Cork, well, they'll hear about it and they'll go out as well in support and solidarity. So this is kind of a constant, there's a constant firefighting with hunger strikes. Now that being said, uh, now just for example, from 1917 and 1920, in Cork jail alone, there were 24 separate hunger strikes. Um, they involved uh, 275 participants. 81 participants were released in those hunger strikes. This is before the big 1920 hunger strike. So what you typically get, but these are also short hunger strikes, two, three, four, five days. They don't exceed five or six days. Uh, there is not, there is no hunger strike is really extended past 10 or 12 days globally. That's been well documented. The suffragists were always force fed at an early stage. There is a sense that if you went like more than a week, you would die. If you went more than a week without food, you would die. Keep in mind also that these are food only strikes. It's not food and water. If you went on a food and water hunger strike, you wouldn't last more than, you'd die dehydration in three, four, or five days. Uh, but with food, you can last longer, but it's not medically known how long you can last. And the assumption is you're not gonna last more than a week or 10 days and you'll die. So that gives a lot of leverage to the strikers. Now that being said, it's a pretty much, a, it's a dangerous game because you're putting yourself, you're cornering yourself if you're a hunger striker. Because you have to, if the authorities don't agree or you don't figure out an agreement, well hell, you're gonna, you can starve yourself to death. You can compel yourself to be kind of cornered where you'll continue this all the way through and you don't <coughs> wanna necessarily abandon the strike because that would be demoralizing, it would diminish all the other strikes elsewhere, it'd be personally like dishonorable, that's how a lot of them would see it. So folks only take this step when they're pretty sure of the response, when they're pretty sure they're gonna get, or they're pretty sure that there's a possible compromise. Um, so what you often get is, uh, you, I mean, generally the strikes are over two reasons. They're not for general releases. Like they, what they are is they're typically for things like the withholding of privileges or the detention of prisoners without trial over long periods. So if folks are basically, if they haven't been sent to trial for months, they might go on a strike. If they are being forced to, to if they're not getting special kind of tr political treatment, they might go on strike. Or if they're being compelled to work, to do prison work, you know, like breaking stones and that kind of business, they might go on strike. 
Uh, so it's, it's actually over the prison rules that are enforced, that are being enforced and that they're living under. That's what they strike against. They strike against the local manifestation, the local, the local implementation of prison rules on their treatment. And so they're striking against their local warden and prison authorities. That's how they see it. So basically, the way almost all of these strikes are, are released is basically you either release somebody, which happens actually quite frequently under the Cat and Mouse Act, or you might get, to, you might get released to a hospital. But the Republicans typically won't go back into jail. They often escape from hospitals. There are all kinds of these where people go in, nurses go in, people disguised as doctors, and, they, and uh, a prisoner has been released to a hospital under police guard and then will be smuggled out. And that happens very frequently throughout 1918 and 19. That's one way. Um, the other one, and the really, really common one, is you're transferred to a different prison. That's by far the easiest solution. And when you're transferred to a different prison, you come off hunger strike. Because the new prison, it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like a, a new slate. So that's the really common one. And that happens all the time. Um, and then you often get like unofficial negotiations. Sometimes through a chaplain. You also have like visiting, um, local counselors would be like a visiting committee. Sometimes they go in, so you'd have these kind of mediations. And it might mean like, okay, so after 30 days, We'll, trans, we'll give you uh, this privilege, or we'll, we'll, we'll make sure, you know, you're actually up for, prisoner X is actually gonna be tried in two weeks, so if you just come off, you're gonna be tried in two weeks, and we guarantee, you know, that's, that's why it's gonna happen. And those kind of negotiations are quite common. Um, and again, the benefits of the Republicans is they, they have this organized structure. So they have officers, they have recognized leaders, who they obey. So those kind, of, those kind of negotiations are relatively straightforward and they're usually effective. Um, the, uh, so let's say in 19, I'll talk about transfers. Uh, there was a strike in Cork in September 1919 and 50 prisoners are transferred to Mount Joy. There's one in 1920, 31 prisoners are transferred to other Irish prisoners. And then basically what they do is when they get transferred, they start eating again. So what I also want to emphasize is the idea that most hunger strikes by far, like it's really rare that people on hunger strike think they're going to be starving, going all the way. They think it's going to be, it's, they think there's, there's a, they, they always see, there's always off ramps. So that's kind of the way. Of it. So what else have I got here? Um, so the, the kind of the, the, the game changer to a certain extent is the Mountjoy hunger strike in uh, April 1920. And again, that's one that's not really widely appreciated. I don't know. I, 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 that's maybe a straw man argument. John, you can leave your mask off if you wish while you're speaking. No, I'm going to keep it on. Fair enough. No offense. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. I just feel a little more comfortable staying a little. I'm just going to back off a little bit too. Uh, uh, so uh, no, I think you guys can hear me. Uh, so um, the Mountjoy strike in April 1920 was uh, involved. Uh, I don't know, 40, 50 prisoners in in Mountjoy, um, led by Patter Clancy, who later died on a night, Bloody Sunday, and uh, and and another prisoner called Morris Crow, who was her temporary. And they basically went on strike and the strike continued for more than a week and it went into two weeks. And actually I don't even know the, the, how many days they went. They went something like 18 or 20 days. And after about a week, there was widespread panic that these guys were all gonna starve to death right then and there. And there were massive demonstrations and a successful general strike across the entire country. The entire country shut down. And the, men, the crowds outside of Mount Joy were huge, they were enormous. And uh, at a certain stage, the prison authorities uh, announced that they would kind of release these guys under the Cat and Mouse Act. Um, 
but the prison leader, uh, Pat Clancy and Morris uh, Crow, basically said, no, we'll be released unconditionally. And they were released basically unconditionally. Uh, and also, in, during that strike, uh, about two dozen prisoners in Cork were also released unconditionally. It wasn't just in Mountjoy. There were sympathetic strikes going on across the country, and uh, probably another 50 or 60 Republican prisoners were released unconditionally as well. So this was a huge defeat for the government. And it was also connected, the, the Dublin Castle and, and, and British Crown Force leaders later said they thought the whole police system was going to collapse and that the military maybe should withdraw. They, people thought maybe they should, with, it should end the War of Independence right then and there. Because the idea that the people who were being released, some of them were charged with murder or attempted murder. Like it wasn't like they were out there, they were IRA activists, a number of whom had committed, uh, had committed offenses that were quite violent and, and quite serious. And so the idea that you couldn't hold them and that they could threaten to, th through the threat of hunger strike, they could go out and you could be released. It, that seemed like that's, that was remarkable. And to the head of the, of the RIC, to the head of the British Army, it was a harbinger that like, if we don't stop this right now, we might as well end the whole thing. And this also, this kind of helps lead, to create the conditions for the bringing in, the introduction of the black and tans, and the militarization of the whole, the whole country. So it's a key, key moment at that. Um, and the Mount Joy strike also gives up more notions to prisoners in Corkman's jail uh, who are going to go on the strike shortly thereafter. So um, what do we got? Uh, oops, sorry. Got my stopwatch going here. Um, oh, wow. I've gone all over. I'll try to pick it up a little bit now. Um, so, uh, let me go forward a little bit. Uh, okay, I'll come back. I'll talk a bit about, I'll talk about how the, the strike begins. Um, so in Cork, you have, um, uh, you have a, a dozens, scores of untried prisoners who have been kept without trial for months. And the reason they're not being tried is because Irish juries are releasing very guilty people. They're refusing to convict Republican, uh, Republicans of offenses, including you know, shootings and what have you. So the, the authorities don't want to bring people forward for, civil, for trials before criminal juries because they're afraid of, the, of people being discharged and not how demoralizing that will be. Um, one of the prisoners who's there, the, leading, the kind of leading guy is uh, Michael Fitzgerald of Fermoy, and he was arrested in November 1919, and it's already August 1920, and he still hasn't been convicted. And he's going to be a key leader. But there are a lot of other colleagues who have not been tried before. Um, so the initial strike, and then, then you also have uh, arriving, you have Morris Crow who, again, was one of the leaders of the Mount Joy strike. He gets brought in to uh, Cork Men's Jail, and he, he's probably a trigger, I think, for what happens. And Crow is also one of these guys who, he'd been at Solahead Bay, and he's one of these figures who isn't quite, doesn't quite get the recognition that he probably deserved, because he was a really key figure in a, in a number of events, especially in 1919, 1920. Um, so the initial, the initial strike begins on the 11th, and it comprised 65 prisoners. Uh, so two days later, it, the number goes up to 78 after a raid, British Army raid on Cork City Hall. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, the, uh, the strikers thought they were either going to get transferred or they were going to get a quick release. And to give you an understanding, um, Michael Collins had attempted to convince uh, the IRA, West Cork IRA leader, Tom Hales, to join the strike in order to get transferred. Um, and so, because he, they thought he would get deported and that would delay his court martial. So that was the, that was the concept. People were like, okay, go on hunger strike and you'll, they'll, they'll transfer you to a different prison. You know, fair enough. They're not thinking it's gonna go, you're gonna go all the way down the line. Um, 
and they didn't quite anticipate this drawn out thing. Uh, the first day of the strike, or the first days, um, 25 prisoners are immediately deported to England, out, out by destroyer. Um, and then uh, they were offered a small meal before they went, and they took it, got on ship, and they're gone. Um, so you got 53 men still on strike. The, uh, this is by the fifth day. On the fifth day, eight untried prisoners are unconditionally released, uh, and, uh, and the 12 men arrested with Terrence McSweeney. I'll get to them in a second. So 20, 20 prisoners are unconditionally released on the fifth day. Uh, and you also have uh, uh, five more are, are, bring, are just heard the next week, including a few who have, who have health problems and are seen as vulnerable if, if the strike continues. Um, and so this is, the, the prison board has released 28 prisoners unconditionally. So they're trying to contain this thing, but it's difficult to contain. Um, the same day as that first release, Terrence McSweeney gets court-martialed and, um, and released, or, and convicted of having documents, dangerous documents and what have you. Uh, and then he is immediately transferred to Brixton Prison in London with the expectation that he's gonna come off hunger strike. Now keep in mind, McSweeney was tried and convicted. So all the other folks who were on strike in Corkman's jail are, are arrested but untried. That's what they're striking over. But McSweeney basically recognizes that he's in a, 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 a position of power uh, through his prestige and that that will protect him and it'll also support the folks who are still on strike in Corkman's prison. So let me talk a little bit about uh, Terry and what happens. Um, so, we, we, for good reason, we associate Terrence McSweeney with Tomas McCurtain. Um, what I emphasize is they were both unknown nationally prior to 1920. They would have been known locally, but they were not national. They, were, they would have been known within the independence movement, within Sinn Féin, uh, within the Irish Volunteers, but they wouldn't have been really known publicly, except that they had been uh, prominent during the Easter Rising when they had surrendered, when their forces had surrendered um, uh, during the, the rising in 1916. But they're not really, it's not like they're big national figures. Um, the McCurtain assassination in 1920, I don't think we've recognized as a big global moment because it got international press all across the world. And McSween, McCurtain was not recognized as a IRA leader, which he was, he was recognized as a civic leader, as the Lord Mayor of Cork, as the Mayor of Cork. And that's how he was perceived internationally. So that amplified the police assassination of him. And as I said, and the other thing about the McCurtain assassination was, it wasn't a one day story, like the later McSweeney assassination, or uh, hunger strike. You had the McCurtain funeral, which is like 100,000 people in a city of 70,000. Uh, you have the inquest, uh, which uh, names police, senior police officials, and ultimately uh, repeats the Lusitania, um, uh, the Lusitania inquest, which blames, uh, which attributes uh, murder to David Lloyd George and senior members of the RIC and the British government. So you have the inquest, you have the funeral, you have the inquest, and then you have the inquest verdict. All those are constant front page news uh, stories internationally. Maybe not front page by this stage, but they're international press stories. And then on top of that, uh, the senior police official uh, uh, blamed for organizing the assassination is his in turn assassinated in Lisbon in August. So again, that's big news because it, it also triggers off sectarian violence, basically anti-Catholic Catholic violence in Lisbon and elsewhere. So the whole thing is, it, it's, a, it's a month long, couple months of stories. That makes the position of Lord Mayor Cork really important. And that elevates Terence McSweeney to an international figure because of the big story of 
McCurtain's death. Then we get um, his arrest in August 1920. And McSweeney was the Lord Mayor. He was TD. He was also Commandant of the Corp Number 1 Brigade. So he's all three of those things. Uh, in when, when he is arrested in 1920 in August, He's in City Hall, which is being used by the Republican movements as a headquarters. The British Army in West Cork had learned of an Irish Republican Brotherhood meeting to actually replace Tom Hales, who had been arrested. Uh, and they descended, they surrounded the City Hall, descended upon it, and they arrested a bunch of people inside, including McSweeney. McSweeney had been pres just presiding over the Brigade Council of the Cork Number One Brigade. So actually, about six o'clock, he was a busy man. About six o'clock, he is on a court, a Republican, a Sinn Féin Republican court held in the council chambers, which he acts as a judge. That hearing ends. Then he goes and he meets with the IRA Brigade Council in his mayor's office. Then after that, the Irish Republican Brotherhood was kept for county court was supposed to have a meeting. And the British Army had learned of this IRB meeting. So they come in, they raid the place. Terry and the Cork, uh, the Cork Brigade Council leaders kind of run out the door. One of the leaders, a guy called Joe O'Connor, who's the younger brother of Father Dominic O'Connor, is carrying with him a code, uh, the, the, the code, the Royal Irish Constabulary secret telegraph code, which he's been handed over. And he rips it up and kind of crams it into a crate, into, into a grate. Uh, and then the boys are all arrested. And then that ripped up document all of a sudden uh, magically reappears in Terrence McSweeney's desk, which was, pl it was planted, uh, which, you know, he didn't recognize the court, so he couldn't really bring that home, but he was really annoyed that they had planted this evidence on him. The point about all this is that he was arrested, when the press covered his arrest, they emphasized that he'd been a judge for the Sinn Féin court and that he was a, uh, a leader of the, he was the mayor and it was the mayor office and all this business. So it was perceived that he was a civic leader while the British go government, especially the British army, were emphasizing that he was arrested as an IRA leader, even though they also arrested him, they also charged him with uh, a, a speech he made, a political speech he made, which they declared seditious and what have you. Um, but the whole thing about McSweeney is he's both a military and he's a civic leader. He's both. Uh, but internationally, he was perceived as a civic leader. He's also probably the most respectable person uh, the, the movement has in Cork. Um, even though he's from pretty modest background, he was upwardly mobile. He'd gone to he gone to university as a mature student. Uh, he writes poetry. He stages drama. He marries well. He married. You know, Muriel is from a the distinguished Murphy Distilling uh, 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 company or, or um, family, and uh, you know he has a child. He's quite sympathetic. Um, the the leader of the men's of the Cork prisoners. Uh, in Cork Men's Jail is Michael Fitzgerald. He's a, a farm laborer. He's a trade unionist. He's from a much he's from a, a, a more modest background than than Terry was. Uh, he was even though he was a charismatic leader in his own right, he wouldn't have been perceived as as respectable as Terence McSweeney. So in a lot of ways, the the, the shift towards Terence McSweeney and the global shift makes a lot of sense. It also made a lot of sense because the British transferred him to Brixton Jail, which is the center of the English-speaking world, which made him accessible to the global media, the global newspapers of the time. So for all those reasons, that really the, the, the attention shifts to Terence McSweeney and to, uh, and to London. And also, McSweeney was a really sophisticated propagandist. He knew how to communicate. He had writings. Uh, his, and then on top of that, you also have his family um, really, um, this is, we have, we have his chaplain, Father Dominic, 
who is described as the most photographed man in Europe after the hunger strike. Uh, and he's, you know, he's, and, and you know, think about to a non-Catholic. He's like, you know, you know, with, with his Franciscan, the, the, the Capuchin kind of Franciscan garb and the sandals and the glass, big beard. Like it's, that's kind of very evocative as an image. Um, and we also, we know this image, which Grace Neville had kind of re-brought in. And so there, really a spiritual element to McSweeney, which is, um, he's a religious person himself, he's quite devout, but it's also, it's kind of brought, it's all brought together. Uh, both conscious, I would argue both consciously and unconsciously, um, by his family and by his supporters. And then you got um, Annie and Mary, but especially Mary. Uh, and Mary is his spokesperson, and she's about as good of an orator as there is in the movement. She is a super effective public speaker. She is, she can, you know, she can give a two or three hour speech without notes. She can answer, when she goes on tour in the United States, she gets heckled from the crowd and she shuts them down every time. She, every time, and when you, when, you, when you see her giving newspaper uh, interviews, she is really light on her feet, which is funny because she had one leg or one, one foot, a half a foot. Uh, but uh, she is really an effective communicator uh, and a really sophisticated uh, propagandist thinker. And so she fronts, she's, she's fronting it. So it's all kind of, it's all working together. And again, you don't quite have that in, uh, in Cork. Um, Fitzgerald doesn't, isn't allowed to speak, he doesn't have writings. Um, he does, at one stage, late in the hunger strike, he does, um, they, they're planning to smuggle in his fiance to, merit, to get married, but the prison authorities find out about it. And uh, they threaten to withhold all visits to the Cork hunger strikers if, that, if they try that. They were, they were smuggling in the priest, they had the priest there and they were going to smuggle her in, they had a ring and everything, but the prison authorities figured it out. I would suggest, had that happened, kind of like what happened with Plunkett, with Joseph Plunkett and Grace Gifford, had that happened, we probably would have, we probably, that would have struck the public imagination quite a bit, you know, a guy on his deathbed marrying his, marrying his sweetheart. And I got a feeling we would have probably learned, a we would have known a little bit more about uh, Fitzgerald. Um, Joseph Murphy, uh, was he was just kind of an ordinary rank and file member of the volunteers, uh, and he was part of the. I, he was a, a, a trade union official leader and what have you. Um, but there's you know he's really kind of represents uh, the ordinary folks, as did the kind of the nine survivors, the people who go out. I'm kind of I've already gone on a little bit long. Um, what I'll just say is that. Uh, the strike itself lasts for over two months, three months. Uh, the, there are uh, demonstrations in Cork. There are player, there, uh, there are big kind of public masses, prayers of intercession, masses of intercession, which operate as kind of mini general strikes. Uh, there are uh, prayer vigils. There are vigils, there are people outside of the, the, uh, the prison the whole time. I'll just kind of give you, uh, I'll kind of close out with, or I won't close out, but nearly close out with this. Um, this is again, this is from Grace Neville who translated uh, a French journalist describing the scene. It, this is uh, the crowds outside, uh, just a, a typical night outside of the, the prison where you would have big crowds at Jail Cross, and also the crowds there were so big that they had to have, uh, to, they were there to say the rosary at about six o'clock when, when work closed. And then you'd also, the crowds got so big that they'd also have thousands of people in the Grand Parade every night also doing these public prayer vigils. Uh, it was a medieval sight, the crowds kneeling in the rain and the mud, thousands of mothers carried their infants in the folds of black shawls, the entire crowd shrouded in the thick shadow beneath the low canopy of trees were singing hymns gently and poignantly. In the first row at the very foot of the prison walls were six or seven Franciscan monks, girt with rope belts, tall and strong. 
these tonsil giants were beating time with their black crucifixes every day behind barred windows. Twelve dying men heard the melancholy songs, uh, which were helping them to die. So really powerful stuff. And the Republicans were able to create these these really evocative street scenes, um, and they used prayer vigils because it was dangerous to demonstrate in this period. There had been demonstrations in July 1920, street demonstrations, where the British Army had fired into crowds in Cork City, killed two people and wounded about 30. It wasn't uncommon for armored cars to drive right through crowds of demonstrators. So the best thing you could do is kneel and pray, because that protects you from getting shot or beaten up or driven over. And they also kind of, that also is a type of communication that the Irish were really good at. Uh, it also played into how the, 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 the devout Catholicism that's associated international with Irish people is also, that amplifies. The priests are there, that amplifies. Uh, the folks are, are doing this nonviolent uh, action which is, has a degree of self-sacrifice and there's a lot of Christ imagery going on, people willing to die for their people. So it all kind of comes together. And just to kind of close out, I mean, we, this is a big international moment. Uh, McSweeney's death is huge. It's international for, it, it's, the whole event has been covered extensively by the press. But the death itself, I mean, look at all these. these are, I mean, these are front page in little newspapers across the world. But yet, uh, the strike ultimately fails. Uh, the, the nine survivors come off after, after uh, Mick Fitzgerald and Joe Murphy die. The nine survivors eventually come off a few weeks later. Uh, and it's seen as, that's pretty much the end of the big hunger strike. Uh, and, but yet, uh, it is had a, 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 there's a global moment. This is probably the, the biggest global, it's one of the biggest global news stories of 1920, like entire, across the entire world. The, 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 the global public was fixated on it, not just because of sympathy, but also because of natural human curiosity. How long could you last? That was a big part of all this. Uh, and then the Republican propaganda was so effective at sending out images and then also distributing it through their global diaspora. Um, that they were able to channel a, a lot of international support for the independence movement and really embarrass the British government. And ultimately, that's why we still remember Terence McSweeney, because of this, because he becomes a symbolized this strike, uh, but he becomes a global symbol of the Irish campaign for independence. And as that symbol, he's, you could, there are few people who you would prefer, because he, he speaks to he speaks to creativity, he speaks to political ideas, he speaks to local governance, uh, and uh, that's why we're still talking about it today. So, thank you very much.